So let's have a look at this case. Two messages. First, we have a good idea about the way to uh, treat AVMs and to get a permanent cure of the AVM in a safe condition. <coughs> but uh, we do things just to get the goal. And very frequently, we don't understand clearly what's happening. So we are lucky, partially, and we are partially good understanding the concern as far as we get good result. So let's have a look at this case where I think being lucky is also very important. You have this uh, malformation and uh, you have to do the treatment. The patient is really handicapped. He has never bled, but he has a tremendous cerebellar syndrome and he's completely, uh, you know, depending on the wheeling chair. He cannot just move anything. So this is the only reason why I decided to attack this malformation. When I attacked the malformation, I didn't understand anything about the architecture. This is some of the selective catheterization that I did. Very slow flow, big, supposed to be uh, direct uh, fistula inside the nidus, but a very slow flow fistula. Usually, when I don't understand, I clarify the pictures. I don't treat the patient. I clarify the pictures to understand. It's uh, too much vessels to understand what's happening, so I clarify. So each time I was facing these kind of uh, pictures with single catheter, I was injecting glue. Simple glue, 40% glue, 60% lopiodol, slow injection, gentle injection, no problem. This is what you got after this, uh, some clarification. This is the immediate post embolization. If you compare to what it was before, it's uh, clarified. At least the picture looks better, but uh, you really don't know what you did. So I was more or less happy with that, and I decided to not push my luck and to ask the patient to come back after two, three months to see what's going on. So the patient came back 13 months later because he could not come before, and this is what's the situation 13 months later. Spontaneous thrombosis of most of the malformation induced by the treatment I did. I did the treatment not to get this result. I did the treatment to clarify the picture, to try to understand. But finally, I got a good result. So I could say that I am the genius and I know how to treat those crazy malformations. So what's left is these little things here. So I said, okay, uh, let's go. And uh, I did the treatment of this one. And finally, this is the result. So this patient is cured, and you can see what it was before. Do you foresee this kind of result? No. So obviously, I did something. The result is extremely good. And the only thing that I, I can keep in mind is maybe I produce a venous thrombosis. And the reason why this patient didn't bleed after what I did, it's probably because after the treatment, he was kept under heparin. This is a very important message. Now, let's have a look at this patient. It's not a small EVM, huge uh, dilated vein during the malformation. The patient has bled. And uh, that's the reason why we did the treatment. Collateral circulation, as usual, extremely difficult to understand clearly, but I forget about this and take care about the direct supply of the AVM. There is nothing from the external carotid system. You know, each time you don't know exactly what to do, uh, you start doing a lot of pictures. So we were mixing, you know, the uh, 3D uh, angiogram of the carotid, uh, uh, which is matching with the 3D angiogram of the vertebral. We put it in black and we put it in gray, the other one in red. And you know, it gives you time to think. And at the same time, you manipulate the picture, you still don't know what you are going to do. But people are looking at you, you have visitors, you have the young fellows, so you have to do something, you know. So uh, you start thinking a lot, uh, understanding that you don't know what to do. 
then you screen the architecture of the AVM. And this is, you know, with this uh, very nice uh, MPR technology. You go, you slice, you slice. It's good because the time you slice the whole body, it takes time. So, you know, you think. After this, obviously, you have a lot of information. Huh? If you can tell me what kind of information you get from this, uh, I am, would be very happy. But uh, it saves time. But they are still there looking at you on your shoulder. So <laughs> I look again at the picture. <laughs> okay. So as usual, when I don't know, I take glue. Because glue, there is something which is very important. It sticks like crazy on the wall. It's perfectly under your control. You can stop when you want. You can keep on injecting when you want. It doesn't reflux. And you have a very good control of everything. The second message is it's good to go back to glue, especially because with the detachable tip catheter, you don't care if you, call, if you glue it, you just pull on it and it comes. So boop, 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 I put some keep of glue, relax. Absolutely no increase of my uh, blood pressure nor my heart beating. And I did this. Uh, okay. So this is what I got after the treatment. I said, okay, all the venous drainage is uh, occluded, more or less, and there is a small portion left with a portion of the remnant of the AVM, of the nidus, which is draining in its vein. So I said, this is a very nice situation, and uh, I will leave it like that, and I will see what's going on. When the patient came back, I did a venous approach of this tiny little remnant, and I got this. Compared to what it was before, if you want it more magnified, this is what it was. So the third message is, it's extremely important to know that when you clarify the picture, sometimes you are efficient regarding the nidus, and sometimes you get enough effect to reduce dramatically and then move to a permanent occlusion. So I was very happy and I said, well, definitely, I am the best, I keep on going. Okay. So I saw this one, diffuse nidus. You don't see anything, you don't recognize the vessels. I tried to approach from the uh, arterial side, but it was not possible. You didn't recognize any vessel. So I said, uh, let's go from the venous side. Let's have a look at the nidus. Huh? It's, it's a very strange nidus, huh? the patient bled. Bleeding yeah, yeah, bleeding case, all bleeding. Yeah. yeah, yeah, bleeding case. So I said, let's go to the vein. And the reason why I decided to go to the vein, despite the fact that it's a very diffuse nidus, and I didn't really know if it was possible to do it, it's because the vein is not big. And when the vein is not big, it's easy to control. So this is what I did, single catheter, the same philosophy as it's right. And uh, I make a plug, I push, and this is what I got. Without any resistance and any difficulties, when the vein was occluded with the plug, it went inside this very diffuse AVM with no real body. This is what it was, and this is what it is, perfect cure and complete cure. So I was very, very confident. And then I got this patient. This patient, she's 12 years old, and uh, she got this deep located AVM, and she was already embolized uh, two or three times uh, elsewhere. And this is where we are, and the patient had a new small bleed, very tiny one. So I decided to try to do something. I look at the architecture, and I said, okay, uh, this is... Uh, the castophonics from the previous uh, treatment. So I said, uh, let's try to see if I can do something from the arterial side to reduce it. Impossible to do something. So I said, okay, single venous drainage. Let's go from the venous system. Of course, I was expecting a very difficult point to fix and occlude the vein. So I put two catheters. As you can see here, you have the guiding and you have the two catheters. And then I start plugging, plugging with coils the big vein from here. After putting coils, I start injecting glue. 
with the same catheter that has been used for the delivery of the coils, and I left the catheter in place. I don't care if I don't remove it, I always go from the neck so I can cut it at the level of the neck. I was very happy. So the vein, this big dilated vein, was completely occluded. I didn't touch the nidus. But <clears throat> I said, let's go. Now the vein is occluded. I will reflux in the nidus. And I started the injection. What do you think it is? This is the angiogram which is performed after coiling and glue injection of the foot of the vein. No occlusion. I said, okay, as far as I have a second catheter, at the same time, I will be injecting uh, the embolic material. I will keep on occluding the vein and getting reflux in the nidus. So I started injecting with the second catheter, keeping the first one in the position. I started injecting and started injecting. And each time I was doing the control angiogram, as you can see here, I was seeing this. I could not avoid the drainage in the venous system. It's fully plugged with coil, with onyx, with glue, with more glue, because I still had the catheter in the position, so I was injecting glue. Well, shit, this vein is still patent. I was injecting onyx. Shit, this vein is still patent. I was injecting glue. And I put putting difficult to get a reflux more and more in the nidus. And finally, I got this. So as you can see, it's a big, big plug. And now I do the control angiogram. And when do I see drainage? Look at this. Drainage. Keep on draining. So I started in continuing to inject. And then finally, after an hour and a half, the catheter was occluded. So I cut the catheter. And I said, I cannot do more. Wake up the patient. This is the CT scan, which is done on the angio suite. Perfect. Patient is awake. And during the night or very early in the morning, she started being unconscious. So we did another uh, CT. And as you can see, <laughs> hmm? uh, heparin treatment. Heparin treatment. So we did another CT and we were expecting a bleeding, but there was no bleeding, but there was hydrocephalus. So because of the hydrocephalus, uh, we decided to put a shunt. So we put the shunt immediately after we delivered the shunt. Boom. patient died. So I don't understand anything. I don't understand why I could not reflux in the nidus and this vein was still patent, despite the fact that I was injecting onyx glue, onyx glue, onyx glue, glue in the vein, onyx to reflux and everything. I could not control. Probably the vein was dilating at the same time I was injecting. This is a big concern. And when you are dealing with those big veins, it's a major concern. That's the reason why I share completely the idea of uh, ISLAC. There is no question you have to reduce the size of the vein before you get access to the venous system. It is much easier, much more comfortable. Now, why did this patient bleed immediately after the uh, drainage? I don't know. So far, the uh, to put the drainage, we decided to quit heparin, to reverse heparin. Maybe it's because we reverse heparin after the delivery of things. I don't know. But this is a very bad reason. So we are extremely confident with the veins as far as they are rather small and easy to control. So you might expect a good reflux in the venous drainage. 
I agree with this like that. There is no question it's better to stop reducing the size and the flow. And then when you get a venous system, which is easy to control, you go from the venous side. And when you don't get a possibility to occlude properly this vein, I have no solution unless somebody in the room has a solution. I was completely stuck. you know, movement towards venous occlusion. There is a big movement towards venous approach, but I think there is a big movement towards venous occlusion that happened at the time you want to do it after reduction of the size and reduction of the flow. I think we cannot attack those huge dilated high flow EVM from the venous side first. There is no possibility technically to control the venous system. clinical pores in the hydrocephalus that there is there is some kind of venous outflow resistance. Here. Outflow resistance is a draining of the brain? Yes, exactly, in, in the draining vein. I think that that's, although that's because that's very difficult to, in the NGO to, 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 uh, to quantify, eh? it's very difficult, but this, we the might clinical and the CT image maybe speaks for that, or? Don't you think so? You know, the, one of the reasons why I don't fear to occlude the venous system in a brain AVM, it's because I think that the vein, which is in a hyperpressure condition due to the uh, drainage of the malformation, is not functional for the drainage of the brain, at least for the proximal part. And this is the reason why I don't fear to occlude the venous system. Now, this big dilated vein, it was rather proximal to the nidus. And there was no real competition, at least according to what I saw on the picture, with the drainage of the vein, the, 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 of the brain. The brain was draining normally in the deep venous system. My hypothesis is probably despite uh, the fact that the patient was under heparin, we stopped the heparin to put the stent, and maybe this was a mistake. I remember a patient that was very fine uh, after the treatment, and uh, five days, he stayed in the hospital five days because it was a huge AVM and we want to control the apparent treatment to be sure that nothing will happen. And when he left the hospital at the six days, we didn't give the subcutaneous apparent treatment the, the night before. And then he was in the main entrance of the hospital waiting for a taxi and he bled again and he died. So, you know, there is a a very difficult period after the treatment. Maybe we should have wait because hydrocephalus was there. The patient was more unconscious, but uh, I don't know. Jack, could it be possible that during the insertion of the external central drainage, you may have hit the AVM nidus and then make it ruptured? Have you checked the position of the tip of the yeah, yeah, no, it's ventricular safe. drainage? Maybe. It was simple, uh, because, ventricles you know, were draining, it the, was a simple the, case. Uh, I can imagine two things. I didn't I, do it, it's not no, me, but... Uh, but the, 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 there might be two things. First of all, you changed the pressure, intraventricular pressure. No, but and you then, know, uh, I'm sorry, but it didn't bleed at the time the, it was delivered. It uh, bled a few, few, few hours later. Okay, yes, sir. I thought that you it know, was immediate at the time, after. The, the, the liquid was clear. Okay, I see. So I don't know. My, my hypothesis is venous thrombosis of the deep venous system and bleeding. Uh, well, that's it. I don't know. The, all the complications we had, as, as, except for the, the last couple of years, the complex cases, uh, uh, Stefan Hudak is helping us. And the complications we had is always with the deep venous system. It's always, and we have the same images here. It's uh, or always the, a couple of cases. Uh, when it's, it's a complication, so we never see that with the cortical veins, but always with this deep venous system. I, I, I don't understand the deep venous system to, to be honest, and why that goes wrong. Uh, 
I think uh, uh, Jacques start occlusion of phenols with very big nidus. So I think uh, uh, maybe possible close of nidus better and uh, start occlusion of phenols system. No, I agree, but in this later case, it, it was not possible to attack from the arterial side. I you can see. So I, I, I know one now is very improved treatment of RVM, but we see many unpredictable situation with absolute. Now we only study, I, I work with this many years, 20 years with transvenous approach and uh, in my experience is 33 years, but uh, we know unpredictable situation, absolutely. All, all okay and corruption happened. If, if if you're not doing the ventriculostomy, you're not doing the you you put that in and the transvenous the pressure comes down and it bleeds. I mean, we see that that's perfect for the timing of it. Um, and then all you have to do is put put that in and let let enough fluid off and then put a put a, a valve on it and just let it drain. It will slowly drain until it reaches the pressure. We sell that with the aneurysms all the time, <laughs> right? So that's one piece of it. But the the other thing to me is um, I I might have the the venous part. Um, on your prior presentation with the cerebellar, one that just kind of spontaneously kept going away. I've, I've seen that happen three times now. And if, if I just see, if you'd asked me specifically, I might have not been surprised. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering why, I'm wondering that this, the venous drainage in the cerebellum is a lot different and a lot more, a lot more networked than we see so focused in the, in the super control space. And so why have I seen that three times? Um, with just slowly taking it down, because each time it's done the same thing, it's slowly taking it down, you come back and you look at it, and, um, and, it's, and it's spontaneously gone away, or come down to a very, very, very small nidus like yours. Is it, the, is it the venous drainage in the cerebellum that's different that makes it a little bit more likely to occur in the cerebellum versus the super control space? But, you know, I have plenty of cases, looking uh, back for the last uh, 30 years, I have plenty of cases where Looking at the long term for ABM that you are not completely treating, you know, you're going to complicate the occlusion of the malformation. And this is the, the, yeah. the reason why we move to this venous occlusion, despite the fact that we were listening to what Isaac was saying, you know, and we were convinced to move to the venous occlusion uh, 12 years ago. It's because when you look at the result, 30 years ago and you follow the patient, you clearly see, I have plenty of cases where a small remnant is left and five years later, it's gone. But we have plenty of cases too where a small remnant is left and it bleeds. So, you know, it's, it's confusing. Yeah. 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 So I was becoming extremely confident with the Venus occlusion. I was becoming very confident with in small AVM with direct venous occlusion from the venous side. Now uh, I start uh, being less confident because I was in a situation where I could not control this venous occlusion. Whatever I was doing, it was leaking and leaking and leaking. Probably inflating. That's the reason why this uh, balloon catheter to inject is not a good solution because it always reflects a ball around the balloon. You know, we have been using the calibrated leak balloon for a long time, and the calibrated leak balloon was good, but after the resistance was increasing, it went around the balloon. 